Hello again, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for this uh, first day of March edition of Alaska Weather. I'm Dave Percy, meteorologist with the National Weather Service, and I'll be hosting today's show. Uh, first, uh, hazardous weather graphic uh, out here to the west, wind chill advisory there for the uh, Seward Peninsula uh, for wind chills anywhere 35 to 45 degrees below zero. Those gusty north winds, temperatures falling back below zero. The uh, uh, actual air temperatures, and that's out uh, at least for tonight, probably early tomorrow, or just for tonight. Winds actually out in this area across all of the western interior will be or along the west coast. Here will be winds will be coming down here later tonight, and will be much lighter tomorrow. Otherwise, this is uh, area winter weather advisory here for the western Kenai Peninsula, especially south of Clam Gulch, for uh, snow and blowing snow. Another batch, another round of uh, snow coming across Cook Inlet and into South Central, all of South Central Alaska actually tonight and up into the uh, Susitna Valley. So winter weather advisory for snow. More snow here for the Susitna Valley. Same thing for the Brooks Range, or I'm sorry, the Alaska Range. Uh, get to the Brooks Range here in a second. Uh, Alaska Range, gusty winds, snow blowing snow. Visibility is down to a half mile or less anywhere in the yellow shaded areas here and uh, up into the uh, greater Fairbanks area westward to, uh, let's see, that's uh, Galena, Tanana, as well as north into the Yukon Flats. And now we'll go north here, or actually, I guess not. Anyway, you can just barely see it right there. Uh, that's a wind chill advisory for the uh, uh, Eastern Brooks Range area and areas of the North Slope uh, for tonight, wind chills 50 degrees below zero. Now we'll move on to satellite imagery. Here's all the moisture coming through, low pressure tracking eastward, weakening as it comes in, uh, but still enough to uh, bring uh, blizzard warnings out along the southwest coast, at least for today. Tuxuk Bay had about the lowest conditions I could find out there. They were still at a quarter mile visibility or less in uh, snow and blowing snow winds gusting 40, 45 miles an hour. And it's mostly blowing snow, the actual fall of snow is uh, greatly diminished out here. You can see a lot of clearing skies taking place up across St. Lawrence Island and coming into the coast and also southward. Uh, some light snow there at the Pribilofs with this band of clouds here. And south of that, still milder temperatures, uh, kind of a mix going on at Cold Bay with uh, pretty gusty winds there. Uh, rain and snow was rain earlier, kind of mixing with snow here this afternoon, or actually it was snow earlier, mixing with rain at times during the afternoon hours. And uh, snow showers up into uh, south central Alaska with the main uh, snow area having already moved off to the east front, bringing a uh, good shot of rain and some gusty winds into the southeast coast today. Uh, Juneau gusts 40 miles an hour this afternoon with uh, rain there and uh, several inches of wet snow falling uh, over toward Cordova today and earlier on Yakutat, mostly just rain falling Yat Yakutat uh, throughout the day today and Cordova, Yakutat and Juneau picked up about an inch or half an inch of water, liquid water precipitation uh, today. Again, some of that falling, well, pretty wet snow Cordova and uh, probably even Juneau as well, kind of a wet snow condition there. Heavier rains down the coast though. Uh, actually Sitka, winds gusting 40, 45 miles an hour, nearly an inch of rain, actually carrying heavy rain at 3 p.m. this afternoon, and, uh, or actually 2 p.m. with moderate rain the remainder of the day today, and about an inch falling there, a little over an inch falling at Metlakatla and Ketchikan today with uh, gusty winds all along the coast there, especially ahead of the front. Rolling us through again, you can see uh, colder air, well actually clearer skies, but colder air up here back to the west northwest and north there. Still uh, some weak disturbances tracking eastward uh, along the Arctic coast, north slope. Uh, really not doing a whole lot except uh, bringing the temperatures up when the clouds roll in there and a little bit of slight snow fog, of course reducing uh, visibility ceilings 
as they pass by, and that'll probably continue to a lesser extent for the next day or so. As this tr low tracks eastward, again, another batch of snow coming in south central Alaska tonight from the Cuscombe Valley. Conditions improving back here to the west with diminishing winds and clearing skies. Today, though, that low uh, was uh, much stronger out over the Bering Sea early today and late last night, uh, up to about 980 millibars as it moves inland here and continues to weaken and will continue to weaken as it tracks eastward. Otherwise, uh, Another low tracked up to the northeast here into the Yukon, front across the southeast coast, rain central and southern southeast coast, and uh, mixture of rain or snow to just snow up toward White Pass. <clears throat> rain today, Yakutat, but uh, areas of snow, again, surges coming eastward there, really quite varied and variable as far as the snow mounts go due to the terrain and that west-southwest flow, uh, upslope areas uh, getting obviously a lot more than the uh, downsloping areas. Anyway, some of that moisture working into the uh, areas north of the Alaska Range, Tanana Valley, upper Tanana Valley, dry farther to the north there. Again, uh, this system exiting, still some flurries going on far eastern Arctic coast, and that's about it. Rain showers on Alaska today, and uh, Rain trying to turn to snow there, Adak and Atka, but snow showers in the colder air back towards Shimia. For tonight, kind of a new system develops out here. We've got uh, uh, another low, about 999 millibars, not really all that strong, but a new frontal boundary here. So periods of snow, central Aleutians, rain or rain and snow mixed, uh, Fox Islands, maybe the Alaska Peninsula, kind of right on the edge there, very close. Could be just a flat out snow situation for those areas. Up along the uh, Upslope areas of the western Alaska range, we've got uh, snow that'll diminish through tomorrow and then slowly, but uh, not any completely over the southeast interior. Lows for tonight. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. Moving into uh, the first flying weather graphic. Not too bad out here over the northern eastern Bering Sea. Into the interior, pretty good VFR. Uh, especially here just along and south of the Brooks Range. IFR, though, shifting eastward slowly. By early tomorrow morning, we'll still be into the northern Cuscombe Valley, banked up on the western Alaska Range on the west side there, and the Talkeetnas into northern Cook Inlet, Manuska Valley. Uh, probably IFR the entire day, IFR here all the way over to the border, north, eastern North Gulf Coast, northern Panhandle and Canal Glacier Bay, and then down along over toward the border with marginal VFR in the Gulf, marginal for the uh, Bering Sea and uh, all the Aleutians in the Alaska Peninsula. And uh, for the afternoon, marginal VFR there, right on the edge, St. Paul, St. George Island, otherwise marginal off to the uh, south and southwest, all the Aleutians marginal to about Falls Pass, west of Cold Bay. VFR here, southwest coast, Nunavik Island, up across the west central interior, IFR shifting eastward and conditions improving from west to east and southwest and northeast throughout the day, but slowly uh, becoming marginal late tomorrow for Kinnick Arm and up into the Manuska Valley. Might have to wait until evening for VFR there. And Copper River Basin IFR up the uh, eastern Alaska range to about Eagle. And really not much change here for the southeast coast with continued uh, west-southwest flow. And that doesn't change much into Tuesday morning as well here for the southeast coast, but better conditions, but still marginal VFR hanging on over here to the uh, eastern Copper River Basin, actually northern Prince William Sound, eastern North Gulf Coast, northward, Northway Toke, uh, part of the 40 mile country. VFR though narrowing out here as some more moisture slips on in with some IFR uh, right along the Yukon River Valley down into the Cuscombe Delta and marginal up the west coast, marginal for the Aleutians and Bering Sea. And for Tuesday afternoon, marginal VFR, you lose the IFR now for the southeast coast, stays marginal though, marginal for the north Gulf Coast. Uh, looks like some IFR here hanging up uh, around the Talkeetna Mountains, give or take, and marginal in the interior, marginal much of the western interior. IFR, eastern Brooks Range here, and central eastern North Slope, but IFR right along the eastern Beaufort Sea coastline. Not too bad out here in the Bering Sea, a pretty good area of VFR, uh, mainly north and central areas, but the Aleutians, Pribilof staying marginal. Moving on to the passes, both and the Tufik and Adigan. Look for another VFR kind of flying day tomorrow for both those passes. 
Uh, Lake Clark and Merrill, improvement throughout the day, IFR to start, VFR to end, same for rainy, good improvement, uh, IFR in the morning, VFR later in the afternoon, windy, same trend, IFR to start, and then VFR, and a little slower, moisture taking a little longer to leave here as you farther east you go, so starting out, Mar IFR for Isabel becoming marginal later in the afternoon, but Mentesta, I think you'll see IFR. You will see IFR the entire day with snow. And Tanita, same thing. Looks like IFR hanging on probably through the afternoon. Won't get into the marginal till tomorrow evening. And Portage, marginal VFR hanging up on the western entrance here due to westerly winds. And the east side, though, uh, becoming VFR probably during the morning hours into the afternoon. Chilkoot and White, IFR. Freezing levels, 2,000 feet now, back down south of Dixon entrance here as the jet sags southward. Uh, cold air, of course, on the north side. At the surface here, North Gulf Coast, Kodiak Island. Uh, right along the Alaska Peninsula on the south coast there, south of the Pribloffs and just north of the uh, remainder of the Aleutian chain. Icing, areas of light to uh, isolated considerable moderate rime or mixed icing here, Aleutians, and up here with weak disturbance there over the northwest down to the Seward Peninsula. And then this area improving throughout the day, the heavier stuff down across the southeast coast, a little bit more in the way of considerable moderate rime icing, but about 4,500 feet. Jet stream, westerly flow, cold upper trough here. Cold air is going to be following it in here over the next few days. 9,000 foot winds, a couple of troughs moving eastward, and 3,000 feet, uh, 40 knots here across the Gulf from Kodiak Island, about 30 knots diminishing up to the north. Modder Chop, Kodiak Island, pretty likely here, Southern Cook Inlet, Kamishak Bay, Aleutian Range on the lee side there, Northern Panhandle, occasional moderate chop, uh, smoother as you head south, not too bad out to the west and to the north. After the break, I'll be back with the marine forecasts. <laughs> Here at the end of the Earth, it still feels like a place for raw exploration and adventure. It's vast in all directions and ground zero for some of the biggest questions we have about the climate. But when we decided to make a series about the frozen places on Earth, we knew there would be one hurdle we would need to jump over first. What is the cryosphere? Uh, the what? Um... Ooh. I have no idea. <laughs> While I'm aware of the cryosphere, I don't actually know what it is. It has something to do with ice. <laughs> all right, that's all I got. <laughs> How do you get people acquainted with the cryosphere when most of us don't even know what it is? Hey, so here we are in Washington, D.C., standing on the roof of NASA headquarters. That's the Capitol building right behind me. And what headquarters does is kind of serve as the focal point to connect the dots. That's Dr. Tom Wagner, NASA's cryospheric program scientist at headquarters. In short, Tom is responsible for making sure NASA knows what the current status of the cryosphere is. The cryosphere is everything from the snow that falls by your house to the icy reaches of the Himalayas to the big, big, big ice sheets of Antarctica all the way at the South Pole, and also the frozen ground of the Arctic, and even some of that frozen ground that's currently under the ocean. If you had to break it down, you'd have a mix of sea ice, snow cover, permafrost, ice sheets, and glaciers. Right now, our best predictions are that sea levels will rise anywhere from one to three feet within the next hundred years. Three feet of sea level rise has the potential to displace about 100 million people, which is a lot of people that need to find new homes. Our current reality places us at a near tipping point, and the cryosphere is playing a huge part in that delicate balance. 
So one of the things people don't know about NASA is that we study the Earth, and we've been doing that since NASA's inception back in the 1950s. And we study the frozen part of the Earth in a variety of ways. Missions like SnowX, Airborne Snow Observatory, Oceans Melting Greenland, Operation Ice Bridge, Arctic Boreal Vulnerability Experiment, and countless other labs and individual researchers stand at the forefront of monitoring the cryosphere. But this year was a particularly big year. Three, two, one, and liftoff of GRACE follow-on, continuing the legacy of the GRACE mission of tracking the movement of water across our planet. Two state-of-the-art satellite missions are being launched in a single year as part of a major attempt to understand Earth's frozen places. Our scientists are answering hard questions, sharing stories from the field, and giving their best predictions for what we can expect of a warming world. We're taking you with us as we follow NASA explorers on their journey to the frozen ends of the Earth as they study our rapidly changing world from satellites, planes, and boots on the ground. What we can do really well from orbit is we can tell when a surface of land is covered in snow. What's tricky is though, how thick is that snow? And it's even trickier how much water is in that snow. What we think of snow depends a lot on where it falls. If you live in the eastern US, maybe it's fun. Or maybe it's just a pain. But if you live in parts of the world where they depend on the water that's in the snow for a large fraction of their total water that they use for drinking, for agriculture, for industry, or for hydropower, the snow is a very important natural resource. For example, in the western part of the United States, 80 to 90 percent of, of their renewable water comes from snow. Snow is one part of the cryosphere that many of us have actually encountered before, but it also plays a critical role in regulating the Earth's climate. Through decades of remote sensing, NASA has kept a close eye on the ebb and flow of snow cover. We now have a 52-year record of snow cover in the Northern Hemisphere, and we can see changes in the extent of snow cover over the time period, particularly in the last few decades where we can see that the snow cover has been retreating, it's been melting a lot earlier in the springtime. The extent is relatively easy to do and it has been done over the years. What's tricky is though, how thick is that snow? And it's even trickier how much water is in that snow. That tricky part is known as the snow water equivalent, or how much water would actually be in a layer of snow if it melted. NASA and its partners have taken to the air to help solve this elusive mystery. First, there's the Airborne Snow Observatory, or ASO, a small plane outfitted with a couple of instruments, one of which measures snow depth using LIDAR. LIDAR measures distance using light from lasers. Since 2014, ASO has flown over basins in California and Colorado, taking before and after looks at snow depth. Scientists subtract the snow-free summer data from the snow-on winter data to get an idea of the snow depth. There's no single way to measure all types of snow across the globe, and so NASA's other airborne campaign, SnowX, is testing different combinations of sensors. This winter, SnowX will test a new instrument, the Snow Water Equivalent Synthetic Aperture Radar and Radiometer, or SWISAR. SWISAR consists of two main components, one of them being the radar and the second one being the radiometer. So with the radar providing the depth of the snow and the radiometer providing the density of the snow, we could put those two things together and get the snow water equivalent 
Here in the chamber, we're gonna measure different radiation patterns that are different frequencies and do some full system testing in this chamber. This, this chamber kind of enables us to isolate various types of radiation and interference. And in about a month, we're gonna take the instrument, mount it on a twin otter in the Grand Mesa in Colorado. And we're gonna fly it over the Grand Mesa and take various different measurements. This is what we call our engineering flight. Making sure the sensors are calibrated is key in order to face the challenges nature will throw at them. Half of the area that gets covered by snow every winter contains trees and forest. And the trees make it difficult for the sensors to see the snow that's underneath the trees. So it makes it difficult for us to, to measure how much snow there is. After the snow's had a chance to sit on the ground for a while, it gets denser and denser and denser over time and it changes. Uh, which is another reason why snow is very challenging in remote sense. It doesn't stay the same. It's constantly changing. One of the things that we often do in the field is go dig what we call a snow pit. You literally dig a, a pit in the snow so we can see uh, all the different layers. The layering is very important. All this digging is part of ground truthing snow X, a way of matching up what the airborne instruments see and what is actually sitting on the surface. The ultimate goal of SNOWX is to figure out what the best combination of instruments would be for a future satellite mission in order to get a global picture of snow. We need to know how much snow is in a snowpack because if we have too much snow and the snow melts too fast, then you can get flooding. And if you don't have enough snow or if the snow melts too early, that can lead to a longer wildfire season, uh, a more intense drought, and we need to know these things for water resource planning. After we had a record that was about 15, 20 years long, we started noticing that the extent of the ice in the Arctic was getting smaller over time. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Welcome back uh, to today's CIS analysis. Not a lot different from yesterday. You can see really starting to get close to uh, St. Paul Island there and the northerly winds. Uh, but the southward movement's going to slow because the northerly winds are going to be coming down. They'll stay out of the north, but they'll be pretty light here for the next few days. Uh, actually, probably for much of the upcoming week, looking at a southward progression. So... Uh, may or may not start seeing some ice show up on, say, northeast point of St. Paul Island. Otherwise, coastal water forecast, south coast of the Panhandle, central and south coast, southwest 20 knots, seas 18 to 19 feet, just under 20 feet, south 20 knots for Stevens Passage, small craft advisories, I'm sorry, Clarence Strait, south of 20, small craft advisory Stevens Passage at 30 knots, gale force southerly sustained 35 knots, gust 50 knots, there, Lynn Canal, and on the north coast here, small craft advisories, westerly 25 to 30 knots, seas around 20 feet. Outlook for Tuesday, Lynn Canal, winds coming down to about 25 knots and 5 foot seas with uh, southeasterlies lighter there for Stevens Passage at 15 and Clarence Strait west 15 knots. Along the coast, small craft advisories, west southwest winds 25 knots, seas a little over 15 feet. Southwest 20 on the extreme north coast, seas 14 feet. Prince William Sound tomorrow, west winds 25 knots. Higher gusts out of western bays and seas at about 5 feet. Good gales here for the north Gulf Coast. West southwest 40 knots. Same thing for the Barren Islands. 40 knot westerlies. Seas anywhere from 14 feet for the Barren Islands near 20 feet over toward Middleton Island. And good gales here just under storm force. Kamishak Bay, west 45 knots, sea 16 feet. Gale warning, southern Cook Inlet, west winds at 35 and southwest 20 north of the Forelands. Those will swing around to the north, come down to 15 knots here, and that's going to bring the colder air in with it. So uh, 15 to 20 knot northerlies for Cook Inlet on Tuesday. And northwest 40, 13 foot seas, uh, Kamishak Bay, minimum gales for the Barren Islands, and west northwest 25 to 30 knots for the North Gulf Coast, Prince William Sound, north 20 knots, sustained higher gusts. And for Kodiak Island, westerlies, keep the gales on the east side of the islands here, Shelikoff Strait at 30 knots, and small craft advisory, Sitkanak to Castle Cape, and then 20 knot winds from the west northwest across the Alaska Peninsula, sea six to as high as 14 feet. Uh, Bristol Bay, west winds at 20, 
and then those will pick up out of the northwest, come up to about 30 knots of Bristol Bay on Tuesday. Alaska Peninsula, north northwest, 25 to 30 knots with 8 to 10 foot seas. And then 30 to 35 knot winds here coming up towards Sitkanak and all of Kodiak Island. Again, gale force northwest winds on the east side of the islands. And for the Fox Islands, uh, well, break it in half here again. On Alaska Island, west, 10 to 20 knots. Umak Island, uh, variable 15, depending on which side of the islands you're on, with 8 to 13 foot seas. Adak and Atka, easterlies, 20 knots. Then north, 30 knots. So small craft advisories here west of Adak, all the way out to Shimia for northerlies. And those seas running just under 15 feet. Outlook for Tuesday, north to northeast, 15 to 20 knots, far western Aleutians, and north-northwest, 15 to 20 for the Adak Atka area. And the Fox Islands, small craft advisories, north to northwest at 25 with 10 foot seas. Southwest coast tomorrow, northwest, 15 to 20 knots. So winds coming down definitely from what they were today. And that'll start later tonight to diminish. North 15, the Perbolofs, 15 knot northwest winds for St. Matthew, St. Lawrence Island. I'll look for Tuesday, northwest at 20 here. Uh, Yukon Delta Coast, St. Lawrence Island, come back up to about 25 knots for St. Matthew Island, north 20 for the Pervilofs, and then bigger increase here, northwest 30 for the Cusquam Delta coastline. Beaufort Sea on the east side here for uh, east winds at 10 tomorrow. Light southeast winds central and west side coming around 15 knots uh, from Cape uh, Lisbon, 20 knots for the southeast Chuck CC. And then on Tuesday, northwest 15 and wells up to Cape Thompson. Otherwise, pretty light variable winds, 5 to 10 knots for all of the Arctic and Beaufort Sea coastlines. For tonight, uh, improving here in the west, winds coming down, skies clearing, snow shifting eastward here. Winter weather advisories through here, look for snow and blowing snow, Kenai Peninsula as another batch comes across. It's going to be slow to end here uh, for the Copper River Basin. As you can see tomorrow, that low center at the surface still stuck in Prince William Sound, slowly though improving, less snow but continuing all day for the Madnuska Valley, maybe to Cook Inlet, and rain, more rain, southern Panhandle, kind of a mixture up to the north there. Snow showers, especially out over the Aleutians, lesser over the Bering Sea. And for Tuesday, uh, again, this low still stuck in Prince William Sound, upper troughs, so keep uh, possible blowing snow here, Talkeetna Mountains up along the... These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.